Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel because every like and subscription helps the channel be better. Tell your friends about it. Tell them about the best wine show anywhere. All right. So this introduction is unscripted other than I tried to remember the script for that part. This is part two of what was supposed to be part one of a three-part series of the Great California Cap Shootout. That first episode when I recorded it in one take or you know, one session was a really long session. I haven't edited it yet. Since I'm doing a bunch of episodes right now, I might as well record this intro. But this is part two of that. I don't know where I broke it up, but I probably broke it up somewhere in the middle. So these two parts is very critical to understanding why wine costs what it costs. The next episode is going to be those wines you saw, and I'm going to go through each wine, its stats, and a little history of the wine. That episode's kind of long. I'm not going to break that one up. And then the episode of that is going to be the blind tasting of all six wines. All right, so let's get into the rest of the episode. Remember about a half hour ago, I talked about the price of grapes? Let's take two parts of California and get some prices. Now, these are publicly available from the USDA. I pulled the 2016 harvest, to be fair. Now, these are the weighted averages for each grape in two different districts. I've listed the six grapes of Bordeaux. Carmenere is almost never used, but you might find an adventurous winemaker that wants it in their blend. The most planted in Napa are Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and Petit Verdot. Cabernet Franc is a close fourth. All right, so for the 2016 harvest report, weighted average of price paid to growers, District 4, which is Napa, Cabernet Sauvignon was $6,828.72 per ton, and they harvested 37,878.2 tons that year. Merlot comes in at only $3,351.79 per ton, and they harvested 8,895.7 tons. Petit Verdot, that came in at a higher price, $6,023.26 per ton, and they only harvested 1,495 tons. Cabernet Franc, check that out, $7,145.07 per ton. They only harvested 1,319.6 tons. Rarity increases price. Malbec, $5,350.60 per ton, and they only had 1,100-ish tons. And Carbonair, $5,500 per ton, and they only had 0.4 tons harvested in Napa Valley in 2016. Cab makes up most of the wine, obviously, but it's only the second most expensive grape in Napa. Cab Franc was the most expensive. Petit Verdot is the third most, and Merlot is by far the least expensive. Now, the report doesn't give specific locations, but you can see that there are a lot of vineyards that grow grapes. One thing that is implied in all these numbers is that each of these grapes has an intrinsic value, has a, has a reputation, is automatically more expensive. <clears throat> in addition to that, depending on where these grapes are being grown, those vineyards might be in expensive plots, uh, expensive areas, or the vineyard is just considered to be a high quality vineyard, so that even increases the price of the grapes more. All right, so now let's go to the next set of numbers, which is from District 13. This encompasses a lot of the Central Valley of California. Now, the Central Valley isn't an AVA, but it's where the overwhelming majority of California agriculture comes from, including wine grapes. All right, so without taking a fine-tooth comb to the report, this is the district with some of the least expensive grapes, industrially farmed and high yields. Cab and Merlot dominate with the rest a fraction of the other two. Carbonara is not even on the report. Right, so for the 2016 harvest report of weighted average of price paid to growers, District 13, the heart of the Central Valley, and some of the least expensive grapes, Cabernet Sauvignon comes in at a grand total of $394.82, 
a far cry from 6,000 plus. That's per ton. They harvested 62,498.5 tons. This is only a small, this is only a part of the Central Valley. There's other districts that the Central Valley is part of too. Merlot, $346.14 per ton. So not that much different than, than Cabernet Sauvignon. And they harvested 35,909.4 tons. Malbec, again, near the same price, $351.33 per ton. They only harvested 3,334.6 tons. Petit Verdot, not a little more expensive, $448.38 per ton. And they only harvested 484.1 tons. And then Cabernet Franc, $395.77 per ton. And they only harvested 43.6 tons in that entire district that year. All right, so in this district, it's pretty much Cab and Merlot uh, are, are pretty close in cost along with Malbec. Even though we're talking about wines, wines based on Cabernet Sauvignon, I'll include some other grapes that make up a lot of red blends that can be used for color. Zinfandel, that came in in this district, $288.58 per ton. And they harvested 158,110.3 tons. Syrah, $336.22 per ton. They harvested 31,928.3 tons. Alicante Boucher, this is one of those tinterior grapes that produces red juice. $271.55 per ton. Uh, but they were only harvested 1,237.8 tons. Then you have Petit Syrah, or formerly called Duraf, $486.77 per ton, and they only harvested 902 tons. All right, so like I already talked about, there isn't a lot of Alicante or Petit Syrah here, but a little bit goes a long way in adding color to a wine that looks a bit weak. You only need 1% to 2% of the blend of either of these grapes. Maybe up to 5% if you really need it for color. Otherwise, you're looking for more than just color that these grapes bring to the table. Mega Purple. This is the industry's dirty little secret. This is a grape concentrate, and it is cheaper and does the same thing as putting any of those other grapes I just mentioned. Your more expensive wines, like 20 bucks or higher, will more likely use uh, grapes instead of Mega Purple to bulk up the color and flavor. Almost all wines from the U.S. that are under $10 in some other countries will use Mega Purple, and or its equivalent, and that is to bulk up the wine's color and flavor. Wines up to 20 bucks will also do this, and there are wines that are above 20 bucks that do it. Here's the thing. Nobody will ever tell you that they're using it. I mean, nobody. Unless it's going to be like, you're not going to out me, right? They, they just, they don't want people to know. All right, so each of the first set of six grapes that I talked about brings something to the wine. Let's think of them like a rock band. We'll call them BDX. That's a popular abbreviation for Bordeaux. All right, Cabernet Sauvignon is the star, the face of the band. It's the lead singer and guitarist combined. It can play scorching hot riffs and sing impossible high notes. No one questions who's the leader of the band. Cab sometimes goes solo, but Merlot is usually hanging out in the studio doing some sound engineering and providing some backing tracks. All right, now Merlot, that's Cab's right-hand grape. They're half-siblings and grew up in the same house. So it's been there since the beginning. Cab and Merlot are best friends. They have home movies of them playing their parents' instruments together. They officially formed the band in high school. Merlot is a rhythm guitarist, and it provides harmonies. Sometimes Merlot gets a solo or two in a song, and it, it sings that obligatory power ballad. Merlot probably wrote most of the music, while Cab added, added some flourishes. All right, Merlot also has a solo side project, too, where it focuses on jazz and R&B. It used to fill large halls, but now Pinot Noir really packs them in in playing light jazz. Merlot's Asian, though, is always saying Merlot's on the comeback, but album and ticket sales just don't show that. All right, Cab and Merlot sometimes moonlight with their good friend San Giovese at the local pizza joint for acoustic sets. And they're always on everyone's VIP list. It's good to know them. All right, Petit Verdot is the bass player. PV lived next door to Cab and Merlot and became fast friends. It occasionally played around with them in the garage, but it didn't join the band until they all went to local college. It can provide a good foundation and add structure. It's not flashy and knows its role. Sometimes it provides that third harmony, but PV likes to stay out of the spotlight for the most part. Malbec, Malbec's a drummer, but can also sing and likes to do mostly, and mostly do solo work. It can be kind of flashy on the drums and can really belt out a lyric, but it can also sit in the background and let others do the work. 
All that came from a small town to the east of the town that Cab and Malo are from. We'll call it BDX Town. It decided to backpack around Argentina for several years. It bought a second home in BDX Town because BDX was looking for a new drummer. So Malbec auditioned. Everyone liked each other, but Malbec decided to split its time between Argentina and BDX Town. Malbec is really the touring drummer where it can share some of the spotlight and provide some extra juice to the live sets. In the studio, PV shares the drumming with Cabernet Franc. Now, Cabernet Franc is the primary studio drummer. It's the, actually the parent of both Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. But remember, they're half siblings. It encouraged both of them to form the band. It's, it helps provide a touch of edge to their music, more structure, and keeps the band in sync. It's not as spry as the others, so that's where Malbec comes in when they go out on tour. And then we have Carmenere, the long-lost sibling of Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. Back in the day when Cap Franc and Syrah were in their own band, the Herbs, they used to travel around to the college towns in the back of a smoke-filled VW bus. Franc had a one-night stand, but didn't know it produced a child. This child, Carmenere, just disappeared and nobody knew where. It was found in Chile, playing in a BDX tribute band, playing the part of Merlot, kind of weird. It was uncanny how much Carmenere looked like Merlot. Eventually, Frank's, Frank's fog cleared, and everyone got together on Mori Povich, and yep, DNA test confirmed it. Cap Frank was, in fact, one of the parents of Carmenere. All right, even though BDX didn't need another member of the group, they saw that Carmenere played keys in addition to guitar and vocals. They were going through a synthesizer phase and needed someone to tour with them, so Carmenere occasionally tours with them, but usually hangs out in Chile and lives the rock star life down there. When it's on tour with the band, it brings a bit of spiciness on the synths and gels really well with Cabernet Sauvignon. While Carmenere looks like Merlot, it's got a bit of Cabernet Sauvignon in there too, so it can hang with both on stage. I know it was a really long story, but that literally is the origin story of the Bordeaux grapes. Go back through it, look all that stuff up, all the references I did are the actual references going on here. Uh, the other parent of Cabernet Sauvignon was Sauvignon Blanc. It's in the name. Cabernet Franc, Sauvignon Blanc, Cabernet Sauvignon. All right, they got busy in the vineyard one day and they had Cabernet Sauvignon. Now, with all this knowledge, let's create two wines. One from Napa and one from just California. The 2016 Fusco's Folly. Now, this can be from any sub AVA uh, Napa Valley. Now, this is a per bottle cost that I'm giving you. So, the actual bottle costs three bucks. The cork costs three dollars. The foil costs 20 cents, label costs a dollar. The tax on that wine is 21 cents. Now the grapes come from Napa in District 4. So let's say I have five acres, that's 20 tons of fruit. Now we're going to assume four tons per acre, which is a reasonable figure for a high-end wine. So 20 tons normally yields 3,000 gallons. The standard is 150 to 165 gallons per ton of grapes. Lower numbers tend to be associated with higher quality wines. Now, much of this is also related to how hard you press the grapes. The harder the press, the more low quality the juice is extracted. All right, so 3,000 gallons equals 11,356 liters, which equals 50 barrels, which equals 1,250 cases, which equals 15,000 bottles. So we're gonna say it's 90% Cabernet Sauvignon. So that's 18 tons, and we're gonna price it at $14,425 per ton. It's a total of $259,704. This was actually a 20.7 ton harvest on the, 20, 20, on the 2016 report and the closest to uh, single harvest tonnage at a very, very high price. I could have chosen one that was an 18.1 ton harvest, but that with that cab, those grapes cost $40,153. That was the second most expensive on the report. The most expensive that year was $59,375 per ton. All right, so we're gonna add 5% Petit Verdot for one ton, and that costs $6,023, so $6,023. And then we're gonna have 5% Cabernet Franc. Again, it's only gonna be one ton, and that's at $7,145 per ton, so $7,145 for that, for that ton. For the Petit Verdot and Cabernet Franc, I went with the weighted averages in Napa for 2016 since they're only like 5% each. So the total cost of all these grapes is $272,872 divided by $15,000, 15,000 wines, bottles, sorry. 
and that comes out to $18.19 per bottle just for the grapes, the cork, the bottle, the foil, the tax. I think that's everything. Yeah. If I went with the weighted average for all three, it would be almost exactly half at $9.07 per bottle. All right, so now we got to put in French, uh, put in oak. So we're going to use 100% French, new French oak barrels. It'll take 50 barrels, and that's going to cost $1,400 per barrel. I went high end here also. That's 70 grand for all those barrels. That is an additional $4.67 per bottle. Now, I went with 100% just to make it easier for the final cost. So I'm not having to figure out costs in older barrels or like I'm amortizing it and then doing percentages of all that stuff. So $100 plus cabs can range anywhere from 60 to 100% new oak. Most use less than 100%, but it's not uncommon to have that. All right, so property taxes. In this case, in 2016, for uh, this type of acreage was just shy of $2,000, $1,859.70. Uh, total production of about 3,000 cases, if I'm making other ones. It's like $0.08 cents a bottle. Now, this is a real property tax of a property in Napa Valley of about 9 acres total. So that means we have a total bottle cost of $30.35. And now, one thing I should mention, that property tax is actually pretty low for a year. So there's definitely some type of agricultural um, discount going on here. Estimated total cost for this wine is going to be $65.35. This is the big unknown for me. I literally would have to see a winery's P&L to see what the rest of their expenses are. So I estimated the winery markup to be 100% due to low production and brand reputation as an icon wine. So that, um, and that equals the cost of the wholesaler of $130.70. So now we're going to talk about the markups from winery to distributor to retailer to consumer. The estimated winery markup of 100% due to low production and brand reputation as an icon wine. So that will equal the cost to the wholesaler, so the, what the winery sells to the wholesaler, and we're going to say it's $130.70, so it's 100% markup. So let's estimate that the, winery, the wholesaler's markup is 28%. So that translates into a cost of $167.30 to the retailer. The estimated retailer markup is about 50%. So that comes out to $250.94. That's what this wine costs. Now, I'm not saying that all those numbers I came up with are correct. I will say that this is what they paid in tax. That was a property tax in uh, 2016. It's only 1800 bucks. All right. So I have no idea because I, I did a lot of, well, I, I'll get to this in a little bit. All right, the 2016 Fusco's Budget Baller from California. Bottle cost is only a dollar. Cork is 15 cents. The foil is 8 cents and the label is 2 cents. The tax is 21 cents. Remember all these numbers. We're going to get back to them. We're going to put them back in a little bit later. The grapes are come from the Central Valley or District 13. I'll work backwards on this one versus the other example. All right, so we're going to base our production on 100,000 cases or 1.2 million bottles. 1,321 tons of fruit will be needed at 180 gallons per ton. So that gives us 237,780 gallons. Bulk wines can go as high as 180 to even 200 gallons per ton when pressing the crap out of the grapes. Now remember this lowers the quality of the juice as it introduces harsher flavors and aromas to the wine, but we'll fix that in the winery. So we're gonna have a 75% Cabernet Sauvignon, or we're going to have 75% Cabernet Sauvignon for the wine, so we can label it Cab Cabernet Sauvignon. And that gives us 991 tons, or that we need 991 tons at $394.82. That comes out to $391,267. 25% is going to be Merlot. 330 tons at $346.14. That equals $114,226. The total cost of the grapes is $505,493 when divided by 1.2 million. That comes out to 42 cents per bottle for just the grapes. Now, we're going to adjust a few things here. We're going to add some mega purple. Now, I'm putting in here 0.2%. Yes, I know that adds up to 100.2%, but we'll say we took a tenth of a percent away from Cab and Merlot to make this work. So in 2006, Mega Purple costs $135 per gallon. Now, we have 476 gallons 
and at, at two at point two percent. So that costs sixty four thousand two hundred sixty dollars divided by one point two million bottles. That adds five cents per bottle to the grape cost. So with the grapes and the mega purple, our total is now forty seven cents per bottle. All right, let's do an oak alternative. We're going to do the medium toast American oak powder. Now we need about a pound per 100 gallons to, to get our desired oak flavor. So we're going to need 2,375, sorry, 78 pounds using 33 pound bags of powder. This equals 72 bags. Now the current price of 72 bags at $130 per bag is $9,360 or that is 0 0.0078 cents. Okay, so less than one penny per bottle. Our total, including the bottle cost and the label and all that stuff, we're now at $1.94 for the wine. All right, so the estimated total cost. So this is another unknown. I'm, I'm estimating that the bottle, everything, including the winery expenses and all that, is $4.24 per bottle. Um, but I'm figuring a lot of cost savings due to automation and being able to scale production and lower and to lower cost dramatically. We're going to estimate the winery markup of 25% due to high production and the reputation of the wine as a value wine. So we're going to charge the wholesaler $5.30. So the wholesaler is going to mark it up only 25%. So that's going to cost the retailer $6.63. The retailer is going to do another 50% markup, and that comes out to $9.94 for your $10 bottle of wine. Again, like this wine, I'm not claiming I know all the costs going on here, but I feel that I'm pretty, pretty close. Now, I didn't figure in any kind of bulk discount for materials, more likely for a wine like this. For the grapes in the first example, I went with the more expensive route because this will be an estate vineyard. This will have a higher cost due to, the farming, due to the farming expenses. In reality, it could be even higher. For the second example, I went with averages since the fruit would be sourced from all over and probably conventionally farmed. You can also factor in all the other costs for both types of operations. I just don't have access to or will be difficult to obtain. So any of the Emirates Designs costs of equipment, construction costs, labor, repair and maintenance, other fees and taxes, loans, marketing, lab work, transportation, benefits, employee benefits, and other expenses I'm not even including. In serving a lot of the industry people, I've gotten some ballpark figures for what a wholesaler marks up the wine from, what the winery charges them. So that's where I got these figures. What I do know is that a wholesaler has a range of 20 to 30% for a markup, and a retailer can literally go from having a negative markup to almost 100% markup. It all really depends on the wine. Some are loss leaders. They tend to be the most popular wines out there and that retailer is banking on you coming in to not just buy that wine, but other products have a better margin. You'll find this in higher volume places, especially like supermarkets or big box wine retailers. And with that said, a normal markup is really closer to 30 to 50%. I then did some map napkin math to figure out all those unknown costs to add to the per bottle cost, and then what kind of markup the winery would need to do to, to get the rest of the costs to come out. I won't share all the cost figures I came up with here because, you know, like, like I already said, I'm speculating what's going on. I mean, I could be way off. Now, what I will say is that total costs, when I did, and I was just estimating, I wasn't like, I wasn't working backwards. When I came up with these examples, I got really close to what the cost needed to be with those types of markups. Um, in other words, you know, basically I came up with an imaginary figures for a lot of different costs and that final number coincidentally was very close to what it needed to be to make the, to make the math work with those markups. All right, so it, it all comes down to the winery and all the other costs. I don't know. In these two examples, I guess that a winery is marking up their wine to the wholesaler anywhere from 25 to hundred percent. The more production, the lower the markup, the higher volume means less item, less less per item profit, but because they make a lot of it, it translates into And wineries are going to also push to see what their brand is worth. They'll have a final retail value in mind for their wine and then charge, uh, then, then change the markup to the wholesaler in order to arrive at that, that same or similar price 
that the retailer will also charge. Okay, so because of all this, smaller wineries heavily push DTC or direct-to-consumer sales, either in a tasting room or online, then add in things like wine club only wines. These are all high profit wines with large markups based upon what the winery thinks their wine is worth, what they think the market will bear. In the end, the more wine the winery sells directly to you, the consumer, the more money they make because they take a loss by selling to the wholesaler. But a wine like this, you can go to the tasting room and buy it, but the volume that you're, getting, you're buying at the tasting room is so low, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, they're making more money from it, but they're only making a few extra dollars. Something like this, they're going to make a lot more money by selling directly to you, whether it's a wine club or in the winery, because it's low production, and they have to reserve some of this to go to me, go to the retailer, go to the restaurant. So they, they do take a cut. So the problem is when I tell you, oh, they make all this money, or they're charging this, it kind of depends on how many bottles are going to the going to the supply chain to wholesalers and then the the end, you know, the end user or the end consumer, and how much they're holding back to sell to DTC. When I talked about those like small production wineries, they're not sending that stuff out to retailers and restaurants. They're retaining almost 100% of that profit. They have to do that because if they cut that profit to go distribution, they're not making enough money. All right. Anyway, the bottom line here. So buy what you want. Get caught up in the romantic story the winery tells you. You know, that its founder happened to happen upon this beautiful virgin land or an abandoned historic property in Napa, became one with the land and went all organic or bio, lets the wine speak for itself and all that. I'm not saying these stories aren't true, but how much of that blood, sweat, and tears actually translate into dollars versus the industrial wine that has a hip tasting room, but no actual winery in the back to, for you to tour. They may have show vineyards on the property to make it look pretty. Those wines also sell you on a story, something quirky, fun, romantic. They both sell a lifestyle in the end. It just depends. Depends on what decks. How big your uh, pocketbook is. <laughs> all of us in the industry get seduced with all this. The stories are great. And when we visit these places as a member of the industry, we get the VIP treatment, private tours of the winery or even the vineyards tasting their most expensive wines, maybe even a food pairing to go along with it, or the ultimate, a catered dinner in the vineyard. Yeah, I've only seen pictures of that on, on, on Instagram. I've had lunch in a big building with all the winery employees and seasonal workers for Harvest Once and Saint Emilion. That was pretty amazing. I've had private lunches on rare occasions with winery and vineyard owners and a large dinner or two at a restaurant, but this is not my typical visit. I, in the end, like I said, buy what you want. Support wineries that match your goals, expectations, values, etc. Sometimes you just want junk food, and sometimes you want to treat yourself. All right, well, it's a long show, and I probably broke this up into two episodes because I'm looking at how much time this took. That's going to do it for the show. I've got links to all the wineries in the description below, so please check them out. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe. And then tell your friends. Until next time... Buy what you want.